So can you really run a sustainable digital business? That's what I'm going to be talking about today. My name is Tom Greenwood and I run a company called Whole Grain Digital. Um, so I started my career in industrial design. Um, I was really passionate about sustainability and I wrote my thesis on sustainable product design. And this is when product design meant like the design of physical things, not digital things. Um, and my first couple of jobs involved looking at physical products and the way they were designed and manufactured and doing life cycle assessment to work out what was their environmental impact in manufacturing, in transportation, in use, in disposable, in disposal, and trying to figure out solutions of how we could reduce this, how we could redesign these products um, and re-engineer them to make them more environmentally friendly. And really fascinating, really exciting. Um, it was a good start, but something... Something didn't feel quite right, even though this was the direction that I wanted to take my career, I was really passionate about it, something didn't feel right. And, and ultimately, it came down to the fact that I felt like pretty much anything I designed, even if it was more eco-friendly, these physical things were still gonna have to be like materials dug out of the ground and shipped across the world. And, and then at the end of their life, they're gonna end up somewhere in either in a landfill site or an incinerator or just rotting in someone's garage. and 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 that somehow just didn't feel like where I wanted to go after a few years. And maybe that was just me being like excessively pessimistic. And I think in hindsight, that probably was me being excessively pessimistic. Um, but at the same time, I was like increasingly interested in this world of digital that um, just felt like it had so much potential to enhance people's lives without any environmental impact. Um, and and that this was like an emerging area of design and technology that I thought would be really exciting um, and and be a solution to kind of replace a lot of a lot of physical things that, that we don't need. Um, at the same time, I was seeing a lot of blame from the environmental community being pointed towards businesses. It was like businesses are like kind of the, the cause of the environmental crisis. They're, they're putting profit before the environment and extracting resources and you know that they're, they're cutting corners and causing all this harm and it's like they're the villain uh, they're the villain of the of the environmental movement um and you know like on some level you know yes companies have have done irresponsible things but but business as a concept i felt was being villainized and i thought well, what's the solution are we going to abolish business like how is that going to work is like <laughs> what are we going to do instead like who's proposing an alternative to that um so I felt like the only solution really surely has to be that we find a way of doing business sustainably. And as a naive, like 20 something year old, I thought like, how hard can it be to run a sustainable business? Like, why don't people just do that? Like just run your businesses and do it in a sustainable way. And so that's what I thought I would do. Um, so my my wife and I decided that we start a design agency, a digital design agency called Whole Room Digital. And it would be an experiment in sustainable business for us to basically put our money where our mouths are and say like, okay, if we think this sustainable business thing is like the direction that businesses need to go, and we think digital is the direction um, that product design needs to go, then then let's have a go. Let's see like how hard it is. Let's see what the challenges are and let's see what solutions we can come up with. Um, so we started Whole Grain in 2007 and, and we initially had like three pillars of sustainability that we were gonna, we were gonna try and prioritize. The, the first was gonna be as a design agency to work on projects with positive impact. So try to actually work on things that we felt were gonna have positive impact in the world. The second pillar was to try and minimize the environmental impact of our own business operations. So how we're running the business day to day. And the third was to make digital things, not physical things, as I said, like that kind of inherently being baked into the concept of the company um, was as much an environmental metric as anything else. So that's really where we started from. That's where Holgrain came from um, 16 years ago. Um, but let's skip back to the future and and come to 2023 like 16 years later like whole grain has come from being this thing that Vanita and I thought we'd start when we had no idea what we we're doing no business experience um just to kind of a seed of an idea that was really an experiment now we've got a team of 25 people we've got a client list that like, that we personally literally dreamed of including good energy cafe direct ecova charities like oxfam and unicef and and we've we've developed a bit of a reputation as 
as being like kind of an example of a sustainable business. Um, so if we kind of look at like where we started and why and, and where we are now, you'd, you'd probably say like, well, mission accomplished, right? You know, like job done. Um, but it's not that simple. Um, on the surface, like it might look simple, but it's one of those things where like the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. And the more I've got into it, the longer time's gone on, the more I've realized that actually like, trying to run a truly sustainable business is, is not as simple as it sounds. Um, and and we really don't have all the answers. So, so last year, we celebrated the 15th anniversary of the business. And, and I was sort of frustrated by this. I like, I should have figured it all out by now. Um, but I hadn't. I, I was confused. And so I started this Substack newsletter called Oxymoron about sustainable business. Um, really like trying to explore like the questions I had in my head, the things I felt were still unanswered and that I hadn't really seen other people answering um, and, and conversations that I felt needed to be had that weren't being had. And, and, and it's that newsletter that led me to being invited here to get today to give this particular talk on, you know, can, can we run a, can we really run a sustainable digital business? Um, so I'm going to take you through some of the things that we've done to try and be a sustainable business, what we've learned from su some successes, some failures, uh, some of the confusion that we faced. Um, and it might get a little bit woo-woo at the end, but, you know, stick with me. Um, I'm going somewhere with it. So let's get practical and, and dive in. Um, as I mentioned, the first pillar of like our concept of a sustainable business is as a design agency was like working on projects with positive impact. So then we had to decide, well, okay, well, what type of project should we work on? How do we decide that? And so quite early on, we introduced a ethical screening process and essentially we would categorize projects or clients as being green, gray, or red. So green would be things that we had decided were things we really wanted to work on. We really felt like they were gonna work, make the world better. So that might be, um, there might be businesses that are doing things to um, like reduce energy consumption, make things that are less polluting, do things in a more socially responsible way, or it might be like nonprofits or public sector work that we feel is like helping like human rights and um, in environmental solving environmental problems and, and so on. Then we had the red list, which is things that we thought, you know what, it doesn't matter how much money it's paying. We, we don't want to work on those things. And that includes things like gambling, uh, armaments, tobacco, meat and dairy. These are, to name a few, and those are the sorts of things where we just draw a red line. But in reality, what we found was like most things fall somewhere in between. Most things are gray um, and, and you're not quite sure where they sit. And over time, what we've realized is the gray category itself is really actually two different categories. There's, there's a kind of the simple gray, the inert gray, which is things that they're, they're Maybe they're not going to save the world, but they're, there's nothing really wrong with them. Like they're they're doing something useful. They might be nice people. The projects might be might be interesting from a technical perspective, but they don't obviously sit in the green or gray category. And and I think like for example, a lot of a lot of SaaS businesses would would sit in this category. And then and then the other type of gray is like what actually is really the murky bit, which is like, it says a bit of green, there's a bit of red, there's a bit of gray kind of all mixed together and you're not quite sure what to make of it. So this could be like a charity that sounds like it's doing something good, but it's funded by organizations that you might not think are um, as, as honest and benevolent as, as, as you might like. Um, or it could be a company that you think is like trying to do something good, but actually the company itself has a like, perhaps not a very good track record in sort of environmental or social responsibility. Um, and so we found it really difficult to navigate this, but having a policy um, that we can refer to over the years has been something that has really helped us to like stay on track and focus on what we want to do and, and develop a reputation for having integrity of like what we stand for. Um, but I, some tips of things that we've learned of trying to do ethical screening, because it is challenging is, Essentially, like, first of all, I'd say if you're going to go down the track of trying to screen clients or projects or, or, or anything else that's relevant to your business, like define your boundaries clearly, um, because if you don't know what they are, then you'll end up 
always kind of getting led down a path of doing what's easiest or doing what's most profitable. So if you can clearly define your boundaries, then you at least know like we don't what we don't want to do this, and this is what we're aiming that we do want to do. Um, my second tip on screening would be listen and then decide. So sometimes that you like you can judge a book by its cover and you think, oh, I don't want to work on that. That sounds that sounds that sounds terrible. But actually, often there's like really, really interesting things behind the scenes. And you have to ask, like, well, why did this client approach us of all people? Um, and who are they? And what are they really trying to achieve? And I think it's important to listen to and, and get to know people and find out what they're really about before you make a judgment. Um, the third thing that relates to that is then being respectful. At the end of the day, like you're always dealing with humans. You're not really dealing with corporations. You're dealing with humans. And so if you're going to turn things down, and you're going to turn them down on an ethical basis, then that can be a really hard conversation to have. And actually, like you know, on some level, you are making a judgment about what those people are doing and saying that you don't you don't really like it. So I think it's important that you don't get too judgmental and you acknowledge that like they're trying to do their best. You just have a difference of opinion and it's not personal, and try to deliver it in the nicest possible way. Um, my fourth tip on that is is like to know what you can afford to turn down. If you don't if you don't have a good track on your own finances and then you come to something where you think, oh, I'm not sure about doing this piece of work, it doesn't quite feel right. But if you don't have a good track of your own finances, it's easy to just say, well, we, we need to take that on because, because we need the money. Whereas if you have a clear track of your own finances, then you can draw a line and say, okay, like this is how much we need this month or this year. Um, this is how much we've got in the pipeline do we need it or not and you can make a call that way and if you do fair enough like you've got to do what you've got to do to survive um ultimately turning down work is a privilege um that you're even in a position where you can afford to turn down work um and i think we have to be realistic about that so um having a good handle on your own finances i think is really important and then the fifth tip i'd say if you're going to do some sort of ethical screening or environmental screening is to accept ultimately it is subjective and it is imperfect and and this comes back to the thing about like not being too judgmental about it I'll, it's you're making your personal opinion about what you feel is right for you and and i think we should all try and do that where we can where we have the the ability to do so but we should also be humble about it and accept that this is like we're doing what we think is right and it might not be um and others others have a different opinion sometimes so Ethical screening has been really at the core of what we've done at Whole Grain, trying to work on projects that we feel are good for the world, um, as well as like projects that are in that kind of gray category to, to make the business function and be viable financially. So that's our first pillar. And the second pillar is, is the operations side of trying to make the business operations more sustainable. And really at the core of that has been sort of the carbon, the carbon footprint impact of the business. So then, then we ask the question, like, okay, so what is our carbon footprint? And on the one hand, that could be fairly simple to work out as a, like a rough ballpark estimate. But the more you get into it, the more it sort of actually becomes a bit complicated. So if you're not familiar with carbon footprinting, there's a thing called the Greenhouse Gas Protocol, which is like the international kind of framework of like how these things are calculated for an organization or even for a country. And it has three scopes. Uh, scope one is basically you bought fuel and you burned it. So you you bought petrol at a petrol station, you put it in a vehicle and, and you burned it. So that's scope one, because you bought the fuel and you set fire to it. Scope two is you paid someone else to burn it. So you bought some electricity and basically that in turn, you were paying the power company to burn some gas in a power station or some coal. And then scope three is like everything else. Like I bought an iPad and there's like emissions in that. I don't really know what they are. I don't have any direct control over the fuel, but I know that there's a carbon footprint of that iPad. Um, and, and so it's divided up into these scopes. And, and this is where it can get quite complicated because in reality, like the higher up the chain you go, the simpler it is, the more reliable it is. The further down the chain you go, the more vague and complicated it gets. Um, but actually, like at the end that you're operating as a digital business, like most things are going to be fairly um, like in scope three and, and fairly vague and fairly hard to calculate and a bit of a headache. And actually like at the top of the chain, it's really simple to work out carbon footprints. And, and I've added on this chart, like scope zero, you drill it. So it's not just you burn it, but like a step above that is you drill it. And I think it's interesting that like scope zero doesn't exist. Um, 
because that's the one place where you can reliably work out carbon emissions. Um, and I don't think it's a coincidence that scope zero doesn't exist. Um, carbon footprinting, it was actually introduced by BP, the, the oil company. So the term ecological footprint was coined by an ecologist called William Reese in 1992. Um, but it, most people had never heard of it. And it was BP who picked this up. And they worked with the advertising agency Ogilvy and Mather who developed this idea of like, let's have personal carbon footprints. Um, and and we'll, we'll push this out to the public of like how they can work out what their impact is, how much of the problem is caused by them. Um, and they launched this in 2004. They even won a Webby award for it. And um, in a way it kind of seemed like pioneering and revolutionary, but looking back in time, it's like, oh, wait, that was like, that was a bit of a like bait and switch that they, that they threw us off the scent, like focusing on our own carbon footprints. And they took us away from like this scope zero, which is basically you you drilled it, you you dug it out of the ground. Um, and and so I think it's like it's important for us to be aware of this um, that like carbon footprints are important, but we need to understand like that the system that's being designed is a little bit convoluted and a little bit upside down. Um, but it can still be useful. So like with that awareness, we can still do useful things with it. And um, and so from like Holgrain's point of view, we, we learned some interesting things. Like I said, we learned that like most of our emissions are in scope three. Um, but then you say like, okay, but what is in our scope three? And for us, we found that actually like, if we dig into that, we can learn some useful things and we can really like improve our impact. And so so it is still useful and and one of the like the biggest things we learned was that nearly half of our emissions as a company were from flying and this was at a time when we didn't even do that much flying we just went like on a couple of trips a year maybe to a conference or to like meet some clients or something like that and it seemed crazy that like half our carbon footprint was flying so it was still worth like doing the carbon footprint analysis and and that led us to actually do something about this um, we introduced a no-fly policy, so um, so now Holgrain doesn't fly at all for business. We figured that actually we don't need to, and and we joined a campaign called Loving the Atmosphere, which you can find online. It's a German campaign. The website is only in German, unfortunately, but you can use Google Translate. Um, and we signed off, registered there as a company, and joined other companies in, in Europe who have made this commitment or a variation of it. So some companies didn't do a full no-fly policy, but they said, like, okay, we won't fly internally or we won't fly to neighboring countries and and i think this is really interesting because actually it's like it it puts a draws a line in the sand and says okay we understand that like this is a big part of our carbon footprint and what we're going to do is we're going to see how we can set some boundaries to reduce that and and just by introducing the no fly policy we like halve our company carbon emissions which is crazy um but but we can do it because we don't really need to fly it's like we just you know, you go to a conference like API days and, um, and then you're like, do I really need to be here? Do I really need to fly here? Or could I have gone to like an event in my country or in my neighboring country, for example, or or online? So it's food for thought. Um, anyway, after flying, we found like the next big thing was like energy, like electricity and energy consumption. So the question was like, how do we reduce that? Um, and, and a big question, can we re use renewable energy? Um, that should be easy, right? We just switched to renewable energy. Well, sort of. Um, it would be easy if we like had full control over our own energy supply, but we we work out of a co-working space, so it's not really our. It's not our building. It's not entirely our energy. Like it's it's shared with other people. So for us, that's kind of a challenge to make sure that a we find a workspace that actually has a renewable energy commitment, but then also like to find a workspace that will give us data that we can include in our carbon emissions calculations and so on to figure out like how much of that energy is attributable to us um we also had this idea that like if we can't if we can't um control our own workspace what we'd like to do is is contribute to the amount of renewable energy on the grid and we don't have our own roof because we don't own a building but we'd like to be able to say like we didn't just buy renewable energy we helped construct more renewable energy that's equivalent to the amount of energy that we're using every year on an annual basis so without a roof to put it on or some land to build some wind turbines, um, we we decided that we'd try and do a community project. We partnered with a climate charity. We found like a social workspace in London next to a railway line. They had some like 
kind of spare land that we could build a little solar farm on. So we put some money in, we put in some time to like help them construct the solar farm. Really, really exciting, um, really lovely project. Um, and I, and I, and I, it was one of my favorite things we did. But sadly, there was later like a dispute with the landowner who had said that they had given permission for it and then changed their mind. And then tragically, the whole solar farm had to be dismantled. So like sometimes these things don't work out, which is sad, but I, I still love the idea. I'd like to do it again if, if we can find an opportunity. Then we have the challenge of like, not everything's electricity. Like we, we live in a coldish country and we have to like keep ourselves warm. Mostly that happens with gas. Gas is not renewable. Um, and we don't really have a solution for that other than just try to use as little of it as possible. And then we have the challenge of like, okay, but increasingly, especially post pandemic, like a lot of work is not done at the office. A lot of work is done at home. Um, so what about that energy? What about that electricity and that gas and so on? Um, we don't have a full solution to this, but first of all, we started just by doing a survey of our staff, like who uses, who has a renewable energy tariff for their electricity at home? And we found that only about 10% of our team did, um, which considering they're a fairly environmentally minded team was sort of like surprising. Um, but actually we found that like awareness of the options is really low and the perception that it's really hard to switch energy suppliers is, is really high. So what we did is we basically like provided information and encouraged our team to make the switch, um, help them understand that it's actually really simple in the UK to switch energy suppliers and it generally doesn't cost you any more money. But that alone wasn't enough. Like they need an incentive. So we gave them a choice of you can either have like 200 pounds every year that you're on your renewable energy sort of to cover your time for doing the switch, or we can give you a day off, every, an extra day off every year. Um, nobody took the 200 pounds. Everybody took the day off. Um, and I was surprised it took as long as it did. It took us three years to get the whole team to switch, but we eventually reached a hundred percent. Everybody in our team has renewable energy at home, which I think is like really real positive impact in itself. Um, and that number fluctuates, new people join the team. And there are reasons why sometimes it's hard for people to switch if they don't have control over like the energy supply in their own home for a variety of reasons. But, but we try to keep it as high as we can. And I think that incentive overall has been really successful. So that's sort of like some of what we've done kind of on the energy front um, to try and like reduce our emissions there. Then there's the question like, okay, like we reduced our emissions, reduced flying, tried to like switch to renewable energy where possible. Should we offset like what's left over? Um, like, well, I think that depends on what you mean by offset. Um, the word offset like can mean many things to many people. Traditionally, it meant like paying other people not to pollute and you know, that can have its, you know, it can have its place, it can have its benefits, but I've always felt a bit uncomfortable with it. I've always felt it's a bit like, it's a bit like paying, paying your friend not to cheat on their girlfriend so that you can cheat on yours. It's like being cheat neutral doesn't make sense to me. It's like, basically, if you're saying that we need to like not do something, then paying somebody else not to do it so that you can do it somehow has never sat right with me. Um, on the other hand, Sometimes, like increasingly, what people mean by carbon offsets is carbon removals, which means actually doing something that removes greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And I think that's where we really need to go. Um, and you can do that in a variety of ways, whether that's like mechanical, you know, like new emerging technologies or a, a variety of like nature based ways of doing that. So then the next question is, well, do you go with an accredited scheme? Um, because you think that would be more reliable, more trustworthy, and that feels like that's really important. On the other hand, there's been scandals around some of the accredited schemes, such as Vera, which is one of the biggest ones that a big scandal last year that turned out that a lot of its uh, carbon credits that it sold just kind of weren't worth the paper they were printed on. Um, and then they're a lot more expensive. So then you say, well, could we just do more of the stuff? If we find a, an organization we trust, could we just put more money and do more good with them, even though it's like unaccredited? Um, and, I, and like, there's no right answer to that. You've got to do what feels right to you. But it's 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 interesting to explore those options. And then the, then there's a question of like, does the carbon offsetting project like support a healthy ecosystem? So this might not be relevant if you're like fun if you're paying for like technology based carbon removals. But if you're doing nature based carbon removals, I think it's really relevant because there's lots of tree planting schemes that are like you're planting monocultures of trees that actually turn out like they're not that good for the environment and 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 then on the other hand, you've got like rewilding schemes that are like not just 
helping with climate change from a carbon point of view, but they're also like increasing biodiversity and creating resilience in nature. And they're really wonderful. Um, organizations like Trees for Life in, in Scotland are fantastic like this. Um, so I think that's something really important to look at. And then there's the question of time scales. Like, okay, I, I, I want to offset my carbon emissions, like over what time scale? So what do I mean by that? Well, if, if I emit like 10 tons of, of CO2, in, in a year, and then I and then I pay somebody to plant trees to remove that. Are the, are the trees going to remove that in one year? Generally, the answer is no. Generally, it's like no, they're going to do that over the lifetime of the trees, or over the first twenty five to thirty years of the trees. But that is twenty five to thirty years. Meanwhile, you've got all these greenhouse gases sitting in the atmosphere, warming the planet. There's like an like an interest rate you're kind of paying on that. So, so that needs to be dealt with, and that's, this is something that's like rarely talked about um and but should be talked about and and so we came up with this idea of like what we call carbon sinking hasn't really caught on as a <laughs> maybe the name's not not very catchy but the idea was like to synchronize the timing of the the emissions with the removals so if if in if we take a year as like the unit of time we should we should remove as much from the atmosphere in one year as we emit and the way that we could do that is I mean, you could do it with high tech carbon removals, like with the um, mechanical carbon re removal. But from a nature based point of view, it basically means we need to invest upfront in planting like 25 to 30 years worth of trees so that in in one year, the actual amount that they're removing is equivalent to what you've emitted in that one year. But it also means that next year and for many years thereafter, You've already planted them and they're already now doing that. It just means you need this bigger upfront investment and you can top it up over time as well if you want to do more. So um, so that's what we've kind of, that's the approach that we've taken to carbon offsetting. Then there's the question of like, well, can we support greener lifestyles? Um, after all, like I like to think of companies as communities. The word company actually comes from Latin words, com meaning together and pani meaning bread. And it just originally came from the idea of like merchants would gather together and they would share bread and share stories and they would do deals and trade with each other. Um, and so like businesses, companies are groups of people and the true impact of a company is not limited to just like what happens inside the business day to day, you know, nine to five. But it's like what what was the impact of that group of people? And just as people who work for a company can come in and they create positive, like big impact within that company. So too, I think the company can create positive impact in the lives more broadly of the people that work there. And that includes a positive impact on their environmental uh, footprint. So I already mentioned the renewable energy incentive that we had for our team, and that would be one example of that. Um, another thing that we've introduced for our team on that front is climate perks. So we've got our company no fly policy but then we find that our team like they, they keep jetting off and flying to places on holiday so how do we support them in reducing that and time turns out to be like generally the biggest barrier to like why do people fly on holiday instead of take a slower mode of transport such as taking the train around europe um so the climate perk scheme that we introduced gives people an extra extra time off like the equivalent of the extra travel time and there's a limit of two two extra days per year. Um, you know, you could do whatever you want as a company, but that's that's the limit that we set. So that if you wanted to go to Germany um, or Switzerland or Italy, and you're like, well, it's going to take me a while to get there on the train, I could just fly there in like a few hours. You could get the extra time off to cover that. Um, I think this is like, and it's a great idea. It's been used a little bit. We, but interestingly, we found the barrier is that everybody, most people, go on holiday with friends, family, loved ones, and those friends, family, loved ones generally don't work for an organization that has the climate perks scheme. So they then want to fly, and so if the group wants to fly, then everybody flies. Um, so I think like the more organizations that adopt this climate perks scheme, and it, it's like a public thing from the charity climate charity Ten Ten. Um, you can look it up and and join because I think more more companies join the easier this this will get for people to actually embrace it and and enjoy the benefits of slow travel which which I personally really enjoy another thing we've done to try and like have some sort of positive environmental impact with our team is we introduced a vegetarian food policy 
this was something that our team actually voted for. I didn't expect it to go through, um, but it did. Um, and this is just for company food. So if we're like, if the company's paying for food or like at a meal or an event or when you're out on business, then it essentially has to be vegetarian unless you have special dietary requirements. And um, so it, it's not directly like, you know, we're not telling anybody what they should eat personally, but I think what it's done is it's like, it's made, it's normalized vegetarian food. Um, it's given people an opportunity to experience it in, in like a, a familiar environment to enjoy it. And, and I think that has a positive knock on effect on like what people eat day to day. Um, another thing we've done to like support our team on their environmental impact outside of work is introduce an electric car scheme. So, um, electric cars are really expensive. Not everybody can afford one. Um, and you know, we can't solve that completely, but there are a variety of electric car schemes. We signed up for the one with octopus energy that basically allow people to get an electric car lease through their work and save the income tax on, on the cost of the car. So it significantly reduces like the monthly cost of having an electric car. Um, and that's something that any company in the UK could do. Um, and it's fairly easy to set up. So, so that's another thing that we've done. And then we also use this platform called Donation, which is like a pledging, environmental pledging platform. All our employees are registered. Um, and it's got all these ideas of like things you could try in your daily life. Um, and you can pledge to try them. Like this month, I'm going to try um, eating vegetarian, for example. This month, I'm going to try cycling to work instead of driving to work. And, and then at the end of the pledge, it asks you, did you actually manage to do it? And, and it adds that up and it, it shows you not just your personal kind of like positive impact, but it also like aggregates that for a team and they have leaderboards where you can get a bit competitive with other companies, which our team seem to quite like. Um, so that's something that has been really interesting of like trying to have that positive influence like on people's lifestyles because it's completely optional. It's just a way of getting them a bit inspired and engaged and trying new things that they might not otherwise have tried. Um, so what about digital sustainability? After all, like, you know, that's what, that's kind of what we're known for now at Whole Grain. Um, uh, certainly it seems to be what I'm known for, uh, these days. And like I said, we thought like, well, <laughs> part of our third pillar was like, we're doing digital design, not physical product design, because it doesn't have an environmental impact. Um, and as you probably heard elsewhere, like at this event, um, like that turned out not to be true. Um, the internet has a huge carbon footprint. Um, an like late, a recent estimate from Lancaster University put it at two, between 2.1 and 3.9% of all global carbon emissions um, coming from the internet. Global aviation is 2.1%. The United Kingdom is about 1.1%. So you know, it might not, it might sound like a small number, but actually it's like really big. Uh, people said, oh, it's only 2%. Why do we need to bother with that? But then you could say that about the aviation industry and you could say that about almost any industry. Um, and ultimately like we need to decarbonize every industry and that includes digital. So that led us as a team to develop um, a methodology for calculating the carbon footprint of an individual web page. That led us to put an online simplified version of that on, um, that people can use as an educational tool at website carbon.com. You pop in a URL, estimates the energy consumption and the carbon footprint. And it's really to get people engaged, get people thinking uh, about how they can like really try to take, like get a handle on this and 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 learn like how do we reduce the energy consumption? How do we reduce the carbon emissions of the, the things we're building, the things we're designing online um, and embrace this as a sector. And it's really important to us that this knowledge gets spread um, there's no point just whole grain digital doing it. That's why we share loads of what we do on our blog, on podcasts, at events. Um, I ended up writing a book for a book apart called Sustainable Web Design to like share a lot of what we'd learned. Because to us, like there's no point it just being a few people doing this. Like it needs to just be normal. It needs to be best practice. It needs to be the standard. Um, and I think that's really important. So I'm not going to speak much more about that today because that could be like a whole other talk, and that's not what I was asked to talk about. But it's like it's become that third pillar of we do digital because it's got no environmental impact has transformed into a we try to do digital with a low environmental impact and now that we know that there is one so then there's the question of like well how do we know if we're doing a good job are we marking our own homework um this was the question that we had when the business was about 10 years old we thought like are we doing good 
So we decided to go through a process of certifying as a B Corp, which is, uh, if you haven't heard of it, it's a certification scheme run by an independent nonprofit called B Lab, um, where they look at like the environmental and social impact of a business across a whole number of factors. And you have to hit like a minimum pass mark. And it's really good. So like, it's really stringent and really challenging. And we learned a huge amount through it. And it really helped us improve as a business. And, and I think like a lot of like what we're known for as a business, both in terms of like our digital sustainability as well as like kind of more operational sustainability really kind of emerged from the the rigor that we embedded through going through the B Corp process um, six years ago. So I, I would highly recommend it to any business that's serious about becoming a more sustainable business to go through the process, if, if nothing else, as a learning experience. Um, but it has had some like bad rap recently, like some companies like Nespresso and Coots Bank got certified and people were like, well, like how stringent is this if they can get certified and people have some concerns about their like business ethics or environmental impact. Um, but I think ultimately, like what it shows is that like B Corp's not trying to say it's perfect. It's trying to set like a bar of like, let's try and get all businesses to like this level where they're they've got all of the, like the foundations of social and environmental responsibility in place and then try to push them to like keep improving over time. Um, and that leads to the question in my mind of like, okay, what if like, if all companies in the world were a B Corp, would we have a sustainable economy? Probably not. Um, even if they all got a perfect score on the B impact assessment, we still wouldn't have a sustainable economy. So like, what is a, what's an A Corp? <laughs> is a B Corp like kind of like nearly nearly good enough? Um, maybe um, maybe we need to start dreaming about what an A Corp is. I I haven't found one. I had I don't know what the answer is, but I think in a way that's kind of the point. Like we don't know the answer, and we need to figure this out and imagine like like what would like a completely different type of business look like? And I think to do that, we need to look deeper. And Satish Kumar recently recently said in, in a, at a conference, all good regenerative businesses are built on four pillars, ecological, social, spiritual, and financial. And I think for a lot of people in the business world and the tech world, like, you'd be like, what? Spiritual? <laughs> like, what are you talking about? Ecological and social, I can get on board with that, but spiritual, seriously? Um, but actually, like, the more I think about this, the more I think he's right. Um, ultimately, like, Many of the greatest minds of history, Einstein, Tesla, Da Vinci, Plato, Pythagoras, were as interested in like the, the non-material world, which is what you might call the spiritual world, the non-material world, as they were in the material world and the material sciences. And Albert Einstein famously said, no problem can be solved from the same level of consciousness that created it. And, and I think that ultimately is the point. Um, there's a hermetic philosophy that says that Basically, the outside world, the material world, is just, it's the manifestation of the inner world. As above, so below. So everything that humans have ever done, everything that humans have ever created, positive or negative, originally started as a thought or a feeling inside a human being or a group of human beings. And it, we then went and did that in the outside world, in the material world. So if we want to like really transform and create a sustainable material world, we need to look inside of ourselves. We need to do the inner work to figure out like to be, you know, more creative solutions and to like become more at one with each other, more at one with nature. And it might sound a bit woo-woo, but ultimately I think, you know, I think this is the direction that we need to go. We can't just keep saying like, oh yeah, like we'll switch to a renewable energy provider. That's all good. But even if we all did it, we still wouldn't be at the destination. So somewhere we need to look inside ourselves and reflect and say like, okay, we, we don't have the answers, but somewhere they must exist. Um, and I think doing the inner work can lead us there. So to wrap up, like to answer the question of this talk, can you really run a sustainable digital business? I think that depends on your perspective. I think if you see sustainability as a destination of perfection, that's a long way off. And I don't even know what the A Corp might look like. And I think probably most people don't. But if you see sustainable business as a direction of travel, of constant learning and improvement, um, and you believe that like that learning and improvement over time has a ripple effect that, that helps everybody learn and improve, then I think there's a lot that we can do and everything that we do contributes to 
an overall more sustainable society, more sustainable economy. So I'll leave you with that. There's a few links here um, where you can follow me and find out more of kind of what we're doing at Whole Grain and on this topic. Um, the Curiously Green newsletter from Whole Grain Digital, the oxymoron substack that I mentioned, my book, Sustainable Web Design from a Book Apart, or just find me on LinkedIn, Tom Greenwood, you'll find me um, and I'll be happy to have conversations. So thanks.